Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. On the morning of June 11th of 2003, at 6.07 a.m., the defendant, Dewan Ferguson, made a 911 call. This occurred at the intersection of Page and Skinker, just inside the city limits of St. Louis. When he made that call, he reported to the police that his 1999 Maroon Expedition had just been carjacked with his nine-year-old son, Christian, inside. This 911 call sparked extensive law enforcement involvement, media coverage, organized searches, and what became known as the disappearance of Christian Ferguson. Christian Ferguson has never been recovered. But the evidence that you will see this week will show to you that Christian Ferguson was never missing and that that 911 call placed by the defendant was not true. The evidence will show that and it will show that it was all a cover up by the defendant to cover up the murder of his own child. Christian Ferguson suffered from a genetic disorder called citrullinemia. You'll hear from doctors and witnesses that will explain to you what that means. But overall, it means that his body couldn't process proteins like a normal person could. He had to take medication, life-sustaining medication, and he had to undergo strict dietary restrictions. Only a few grams of protein he could have per day. However, you will hear that if he followed that diet, and he received his medications, he would appear just like a normal child, a normal person. You saw that video. Christian Ferguson looked like any other little boy. Walking, talking, playing around with his family. You wouldn't know that he had some sort of genetic disorder. You will hear from Theta Person, who is Christian's, Christian's mother. You'll hear from his sister, Lynn Ferguson who formerly identified as Connor Ferguson. We talked about that in jury selection. You'll hear from his aunt, Sharon, and they will all talk to you about what Christian's life was like as he was growing up. And then everything changed for Christian in January of 2001, January 16th of 2001 specifically. You will hear that the defendant, Dewan Ferguson, had full legal and physical custody of Christian during this time. And on January 16th of 2001, Christian had to go to the hospital. What you will also hear is that both the defendant and Theta were well instructed by doctors on what to keep an eye out for with Christian. If he, if his, if he received too much protein or if he didn't receive his medicine or if something happened, the ammonia levels in his body would start to rise. And when those levels started to rise, that put him at risk for falling into a coma, suffering brain damage, and ultimately could result in his death. They were trained on what to look out for. Confusion, lethargy, not acting right, vomiting, things like that. Stuff that, if that happened to a normal child, a parent would closely monitor, but it might not automatically result in a trip to the emergency room. That was not the case for Christian Ferguson. 
if something like that, these outward symptoms were being displayed, they were to take him in to see his doctor. Well, on the evening of January 15th of 2001, Christian started getting sick. From the defendant's own words, he was vomiting. The defendant didn't take him to the hospital. Instead, he put him in his bedroom, put him to sleep. The next morning, in the 10 o'clock hour, is when he decides to make that call. Christian's not seen at the ER until closer to noon. By this point, Christian Ferguson had slipped into a coma, <coughs> suffered extensive brain injury, was hospitalized for months. And that is when his life changed. And that is when Christian Ferguson became the disabled little boy that everyone heard about on the news. He never needed to get to that point. His parents were instructed on what to look out for. After Christian suffered that coma, he couldn't walk. He couldn't talk. He couldn't use the restroom anymore. He had to go back into diapers and he had to have a feeding tube inserted in which he received most of his nutrition and his medication. <laughs> No longer that little boy you all just saw on that video. So during this time period, starting in January of 2001, leading into June of 2003, is the charged time period. And the defendant is now standing trial for his actions and inactions during that time period by failing to provide Christian Ferguson with proper nutrition and medication and ultimately caused his death. So let's flash forward. You will hear that the Fergusons had in-home nurses that were provided to them by Medicaid. You will hear from two of them. Let's start with Tridell Day. She was an at-home nurse in the Ferguson household. They worked 40 hours a week. That was it. When they weren't there, Christian was under the supervision of his father. Tridell Day will get in here and she will tell you that when she would go to get Christian in the morning, he'd be filthy. She would have to give him a bath before she would take him out of the house to her home. She would provide him food because it wasn't being provided in the home. When she would drop Christian off at the end of her shift, and show up the next day, he would still be in the same outfit. He would be in double wrapped urine soaked diapers that had never been changed. She will tell you that she would measure out and mix up the amount of formula that he would need for that in between time period when she wasn't there. And the next day, a lot of it would still be left, meaning Christian never received it. She would keep an eye on the medicine and would notice that it didn't change much between when she would left, leave and when she would come back, meaning Christian wasn't getting it. Trudell Day will tell you a lot about what she observed in that home and the treatment Christian was receiving. You will also hear from Kim Nero, Kim Nelson now. She was the last at-home nurse that was in the Ferguson household. She will tell you that she had to perform several functions that weren't necessarily required of them, such as ordering the prescriptions and the medicines because the defendant didn't do it. And she will tell you that in February leading into March of 2003, she went to go get a order filled and the doctors wouldn't sign off on the prescription because they had not seen Christian Ferguson in over a year. You will hear from his doctors. You will hear from his dietitian. Christian was supposed to be seen regularly. Nancy Brody, his dietitian, will say she actually wanted to see him monthly. They sent letters to the Ferguson home. They made calls for follow-up appointments. They went unanswered. So when Kim Nero went to go get this prescription ordered and was told this, they said, we won't do it until we see Christian and can check on him. 
Kim Nero is the individual that took Christian Ferguson to the hospital because the defendant didn't even bother to go. And what Christian, when Christian was presented to the doctors, they were alarmed. He had lost weight, significant weight. And they will tell you that when a child is nine, they're expected to grow and develop. He was not meeting his growth. In fact, he was suffering. They wanted to do those follow-up appointments. They never happened. This occurred in March of 2003. A lot happened in March of 2003 in that it was the last time several individuals ever saw Christian. Doctors never saw him again. And let's talk about somebody else, very important. Let's talk a little bit about Theta Person, Christian's mother. She had visitations with Christian that was facilitated through an agency called Heritage House. And these occurred on the weekends. She would get him for several hours. On March 22nd of 2003, she went to Heritage House to have one of these visitations occur. And she will say Christian just didn't look right. He looked tired, lethargic. He just didn't seem right. He wasn't his usual bubbly self when he saw his mom. Hi, this is the beginning of the prosecution's opening statement in our next trial out of Missouri. We're going to slip a break in here as we approach the top of the